people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a guy who, when he eats strawberries, just rips off the green part and the leaves and eats the rest without even cutting the small notch out first, Mike Vanabogar. Wow. Thank you, Joe. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for that intro. Uh, Do you know what I'm talking about? I do. Do you just, you cut the little notch out, right? I just cut the the top off. The whole top? Yeah. No, you don't. You just rip the leaves off and eat the whole thing. You no. even leave a little behind. Well, I do it wrong then. Yep. <laughs> um, so I uh, thank you. That once was a e- bad one. That was a bad <laughs> one. That was bad. I can't have all good ones. No. Um, but uh, thank you once again to all of our loyal listeners for tuning in. We've got uh, Andy back in the studio again. Welcome We're- back, Andy. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. We're doing another uh, episode on Gwen. So this will be the fourth episode. If you have not listened to the first three episodes, I encourage you to... Uh, go back to episode one and just work your way through all of our episodes, and you'll eventually get to them. Um, <laughs> so, a couple Patreon supporter shout outs. We've got Crystal Haverfield, uh, Clorinda Landeros, Jackie Ryan, and Kristen uh, Irvin. So, thank you so much for supporting the show. Um, quick, we've got a, a special birthday shout out. So, a friend of the show, her husband is. Uh, a little under the weather. His birthday is this Saturday, so uh, we just want to give a special Locations Unknown happy birthday to Edwin Hom. Happy birthday, Edwin. Hope you feel better. Yeah, I hope, hope I said that right. And uh, I was thinking like we should have done something like they did in the movie Waiting, where they come and sing a really bad version of Happy Birthday. <laughs> just but, scream at the kid. Yeah, but uh, we're not going to do that. But no. Happy birthday, regardless. Um, big news for the show, Joe. Big news. <laughs> if we... Uh, between our last episode, we hit 500,000 downloads. Oh, wrong oh. button. I don't I don't have a button for this. What? Just a... Just... <laughs> oh. <laughs> just... Oh. <laughs> but I... I don't have any, any like, clapping <laughs> button. Yeah, so uh, it's a pretty big uh, milestone for the podcast, so we're going to do a, a, a cheers to it, and I en- encourage everyone listening at home to grab a drink. If you're not already grabbing one, Joe, can you pour us? Yes, some of this... J. Henry and Sons Wisconsin Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, it's a big accomplishment for us. Joe and I never thought we would ever get to 500,000 downloads. You know who else didn't think that? Cletus. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Eat it, Cletus. (laughs) We don't even edit our show, and we ain't changing anything. uh, Cheers cheers to that, guys. Uh, Salute. Andy, you're part of this, too, now, because you've been on several episodes. Uh, You brought us this case. (laughs) So... (laughs) Salute. Cheers. And uh, so hopefully all of you at home just uh, took a drink. And uh, yes, it's not, you know, it would have been possible with everybody at home listening. And uh, a quick little jab at, at Cletus. Um, if you're uh, on our Facebook page, we got a really amazing review from a gentleman that goes by the name Cletus. And it was so funny <laughs> we had to post it. Um, and if if you want to hear our real reaction to that, we're going to... So we shouldn't read it now? No, no, no. Okay, we won't even read that one. No, so we're going to do a Patreon-only episode right after this where we're going to go through a bunch of reviews we have and, you know, give our uh, comments on them. And, good uh, and bad. Good and bad and kind of counter, you know, some of the stuff they're saying. So, uh, in, including Cletus. Yeah, so, Andy's going to join us for that. Yes. Can't wait. Um, so, yeah, if you want to hear that, you got to join Patreon. It's only $5 a month, so... Very cheap, and you'll get a bumper sticker out of it, and you'll get to listen to, I think we're up to 26 or 27 Patreon-only episodes. And this episode will actually come out on Patreon tomorrow, several days early. So you get that, too. That's good. Um, finally, to wrap this up so we can get right into the episode, we've got some new uh, shirts out on our Facebook store for the uh, ladies that listen to the show. Uh, we'll get other shirts out there as soon as we can. It's just a lot of work to get it set up, so... 
Yeah, textiles are not easy, we no. found. You have to like <laughs> either do drop shipping, which isn't always the greatest, or we have to like warehouse yeah. shirts, which uh, we're still trying to get a studio, so we're not going to be warehousing yes. merch. Um, and uh, finally, if you is that our number there, Joe? The uh, if you want to call and complain, Cletus, I would prefer you call in person. Let's, we want to hear your voice. Yes, I want to hear uh, what Cletus the Slack Jawed Yokel sounds like. Uh, the number is 208 Three nine one six nine one three. Oh, and Joe, I wanted to ask you before we get into the the episode. You've got this amazing looking, uh, looks like a pool party shirt on. Can you tell us well, a little, is, bo- little is, about that shirt? This is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mention the shirt. I'm wearing a shirt with pineapples with sunglasses on. Um, I was going to. I bought the shirt specifically for a party that I'm no longer going to, uh, for whatever reason. And it's just pineapples with sunglasses. So it's, it's it, pretty awesome. It could be like my new show shirt. I don't know. Yeah, it's a beautiful I shirt. I, I like it. We could all just start wearing shirts like that. Ooh, I like that idea. Yes. Just change shirts every time. Um, I thought I had something else to say, but people will leave reviews that we talk too long. So You mentioned our Patreon yes. and, our, and all the other things. Um, yeah, so uh, Joe, tell us a little about what we're about to listen to. So this is the interview with Gwen's stepsister, Dora. And if you listen to the last interview, we got a lot of new information. Uh, We've now, uh, we were talking about it before the show started. We've kind of upgraded from being reporters who were just finding the information and doing the FOIA request to now we're interviewing the people who were there on the ground live experiencing this. So you're getting a whole nother dimension of this, the people, the feelings, the emotions, the things that they were going through. So it's you know, Mike and I and, and Andy up until that point were just kind of making assumptions uh, about what we thought based on the data that Andy got us because uh, he did most of that, that research work. That's all Andy. That's why he's here. And it was really unique to listen to the individuals who were there dealing with it, going through the pain, the agony, the loss of their friend, their, their family member. And a, you know, they reached out to us because we were kind of spot on. In, in what we were, the path we were going down, they all agree. And they wanted, you know, to come out and reaffirm what we're doing with the case and make sure that this, you know, this doesn't go cold, that we can keep this thing alive and, and do Gwen some justice, hopefully. I don't know. Was that a, was that a good overview? That was good. Okay. Um, so we are not going to interrupt during the interview. We'll, uh, we'll jump back in at the end and kind of give our thoughts about what we heard, and this is the first time Andy's hearing it. So Yeah, and if you are l- listening only, we'll have, uh, usually it releases a little bit later because there's a lot to do with the video. Uh, in the last interview, we had stuff pulled up for location. So what I'll try and do as it's going live, I might be searching stuff up uh, that you will be able to see. So I highly recommend uh, listening to it, but also going back, checking out the video because we'll have some source documents and things that we've received uh, that we feel are appropriate to show on the show, and uh, we'll just take it from there. Uh, how about you introduce yourself to the audience and tell us your relation to, to Gwen. My name is Dora and I am Gwen's sister. Although we are not sisters by blood, it was through marriage. Um, we grew up as sisters. We talked to her friend yesterday and I know you're still close with her and, and talking about this case. What we want to kind of get from you is, is a timeline uh, from your perspective of events leading up to uh, the day Gwen supposedly committed suicide. So I was re-entered in Gwen's life um, approximately seven weeks before she passed. Um, I had disconnected a little bit for 20 some years and then we reconnected, um, immediately met, talked, our families had met. Uh, My daughter and I went up to visit her and Eric and the children uh, for dinner and spent some time with them. And it was, everything seemed to be normal in my eyes. Perfect. Um, You know, family situation. My stepson told me that, you know, they seem like real legit people. And mind you, you know, at the time 18 and um, it, you know, I would have never have thought, anything like this would happen. And, um, in the middle of the night, I received a text, which I didn't read until I got up in the morning and it was probably like four o'clock and it said, have you heard or have you heard from Gwen? And it was a text message from Eric 
And I said, what do you mean? Have I heard from her? What's going on? And then I just immediately called him and he told me Gwen left last night. She's missing and search and rescue is looking for her. I immediately said, okay, I'm on my way. Um, he said, no, no, don't come. We don't know anything. My reply was clearly, you're telling me my sister is missing and I'm not coming. I'm on my way. I mean, immediately my daughter and I packed an overnight bag and we left. It takes us about three hours to get there. Um, we arrived and um, it was just like, very weird when we entered the home um it it just you know the behaviors was weird uh, I don't even know how to explain it but um we you know we just like waited I thought hey somebody's here to take care of my kids I'm gonna go look for my wife or I'm gonna go and seek some answers I mean this is a huge bridge and there was none of that. It was just like waiting and talking, um, kind of like reminiscing of, you know, when we first met or when he and her first met and talked about a table that they bought. And I mean, just very odd things. And we received um, a phone call that they were going to end search and rescue. Um, they were going to send us a PowerPoint and then they would call us back and we would go over the PowerPoint. And the time that they had this, he was laying on the ground. And I'm like looking at the PowerPoint and it, it was surreal. I asked, you know, at the end of the PowerPoint, I'm like, well, what do we do from here? What, you know, I don't understand. What do we do? And he said, wait there. There will be, um, you know, contact from, I think he said the police or a detective or whatever. And, and this, this is so the person went, in charge of the search and rescue is telling you this. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. And so then we did just that. Um, I mean, I had my daughter try to, you know, play with the children and, and talk to them. Um, like them now, I lost my mom at a very young age, different circumstances, but so I'm relating all around here. And so, um, it, it was very, you know, just very odd. He took, in fact, a Jack Daniels bottle off the refrigerator and said, Gwen wouldn't approve of this. Would you like a shot with me? And I was just like, oh yeah, sure. And know, first of all, I'm not a big drinker. I took a sip and I'm like, uh, you know, and then he finished his glass and my glass. Now to me, I'm like, I just was told they quit looking for my wife, you know, okay, I can relate. But then as the day went on and he drank and I still was not putting two and two together. I had no con, no contact with anybody. I didn't know any of her friends. I didn't know, you know, and their neighbors and they kind of live secluded and it, it was just a very weird day. So, um, so were you unaware of like the domestic uh, issues that were occurring at all? Like she I had been... no, I had no clue. Okay. Um, yeah, no clue of anything in my eyes in those seven weeks, everything was okay. It, you know, no complaints. Um, he went away on business trips, came back. Um, you know, the children were in piano and ballet and baseball and there was no clue of anything whatsoever. And they had just recently moved into their home. So it, it was to me, it would have been normal. Um, but the, my daughter had told me that the little, the, the daughter had said to me, um, or sorry, said to my daughter, um, there was a bloody knife and some tissues on the counter, but dad, dad cleaned them up. And I was like, well, wait, what? And she didn't tell me this until we were on our way home the following day. 
And I, you know, I mentioned that to the detective and whatnot, but it, you know, it now explains a lot how apparently there was a cut on her left arm and how she was holding her arm in the video. Um, you know, um, I believe the detective said it looked like it had been cleaned up. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. What happened? I don't know. I do know that the day, the day of she had texted me and she said, I haven't been feeling well. I'm going to the ER. And And this is, this is Gwen texting you on like, what was that? March 19th? No, it would. um, I would have to go back and look. It would have been, I believe the 20th. The 20, it would have been the 19th or the 20th. Okay. I, I would have to go back and look at the exact date. But she said she was going to the ER and I was like, you know, please let me know. Do you need anything? I said, I don't care what it is. I will come up there, bring it. She said, no, Eric, I sent Eric to the store to get what we needed, you know, in case we have to quarantine. And um, later to find out that she didn't want to go to the hospital. Um, according to what the kid said to me, that dad made mom go because she wasn't feeling well. Um, I don't know the test results. I've never seen them. Um, I'm sure the detective has them. He's. Ne- I've inquired. He hasn't told me physically if she did or did not have COVID, but she did have an autoimmune disease mm-hmm. um, called um Schroen's disease and from what she told me that it was not that it was getting better but she was feeling better and her medication had been um, decreasing so she was working with some doctors there in uh, I don't know if it was in Seattle I believe but um, anyway uh, you know and then the, the last text message I just said please let me know if you need anything She told me um, she was home. She was going to go to bed. She was really, really tired. And I, unfortunately, my last words were to her that I like the idea, you know, of you taking a nap and resting and, you know, text me when, you know, when you're feeling better. And that was, that was it. Then it came his text message later that night. And then the unfolding of everything thereafter. So you'd mentioned when you arrived at the home after you said you were coming there yeah. that you, you felt like uh, Eric wasn't acting completely normal. Was there a point in time uh, from the point when you got there to as all this was unfolding where you maybe started thinking that there's something else going on? Well, it, you know, it was really interesting throughout the whole day. I, you know, I just was watching the behavior. Like, I mean, I would have, if my husband were missing, I would have been crazy out there. You're here with the kids. I'm going. Um, but there was not, none of that behavior, just kind of lackadaisical um, about everything. He, at one point, uh, we were all sitting at the table, and my daughter said, Mom, the police are here. And this was later in the evening. And I said, take the kids to the room. And Eric went outside, and he was holding their dog, and I followed him and I grabbed the dog out of his arms and put it in the house. And the clergyman said, is this Gwendolyn house, of course, house? And he said, yes, sir. And now mind you, why he was, while he was saying this, he had his hands in a praying motion and he was kind of shaking. And the whole time he's like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And I am just looking like at him expecting to like pick him up that he was going to fall. And it, it was really weird. They left and he goes into the house and he, they have this big bookshelf along the wall and he just started um, kissing his fingers and touching the pictures of hers and saying, why, why? And he would flip the pictures over after he would do that. And, every picture that it had of her in there, that's what he did. And then he just laid on the floor and he's like, why, why? 
And it was like kind of a scary moment. I wasn't sure if I was going to have to call 911 for help or, or not. Um, and then, you know, he just got up and it was the remainder of the night. He just talked about, you know, reminiscing and, you know, I told him, I said, Eric, these children have been through something tragic today. You know, we need to have a conversation with them. They, you know, they're not comprehending and he wanted to do that alone. So, you know, at this point I, you know, I wasn't thinking anything. Um, my daughter and I had left and then we had come back and, um, I don't know what he said to them, how he said it to them. Uh, we stayed the night that night, the little girl slept on a, um, the fold out couch with my daughter and I, and in the middle of the night, my daughter, she's like, mom, she said, I, I cannot sleep. She said, I can't sleep. I I thought that he was going to hurt me, but backtrack, um, after he, Eric must have drank so much that I didn't see that he was passed out, um, on the couch. And I looked at her and I said, do you think he had anything to do with this? And I nodded over to him and she said, Oh mom, I watch enough, you know, shows that they always say the husband did it. And it, you know, it was just why I felt that way. It was, his behavior that whole day leading up to this. And now I had time to sit and process. And yeah, I, it was very well, that's odd. interesting. It's interesting. You said that because, um, uh, Dawn had mentioned, and we kind of agreed with her that, you know, he, he, to us, he really seems kind of like almost like a sociopath. He's able mm-hmm. to turn emotions on and off at like a drop of a hat. And when the, you know, like Joe and I were talking with Don, we're like, if the cops showed up and said, like, like you said, one of our wives was missing or they found her, you know, in the river, we would be devastated, absolutely devastated. I mean, yeah, no. And you would expect, you would expect that from normal people. And he's very, very controlling of people. He knows how to manipulate. Um, I mean, there, you know, there's just so many things that had, occurred and a lot of them I have unfortunately I should have kept a a journal of all the events um, but trying to live life and then live this life um, was unbelievable but anything major that occurred I did email the detective to the point I hope he didn't dismiss anything that I was emailing because to me any little fact is a is a fact um yeah it, you know, I eventually, um, yeah, it, it was really weird that night that, you know, my daughter was just, um, you know, I said, do you think he did it? Why would I even say that? I, this is the second time I had met the guy. Yeah. Why would I even yeah. say that? Well, when you, so, when, when you're, when you're explaining his actions and how they, there's some gut feeling, which, uh, we've talked about it a lot in the show. I think, to me, gut feelings should be listened to more than I think people get them credit for it. I look at it as like thousands and thousands mm-hmm. of years of evolution of knowing when something isn't right. I think that's what that is. So when you were feeling that, could you tell if the the way he was acting or the things he was doing was more of an act than something of some sincere emotion? Um, you know, I, I will be honest. I wasn't even thinking about that at the time it sure I just for me it was it wasn't about me but I was trying to process like I can't believe this is my life I can't believe that this is happening I've only had her back for seven weeks and you know my daughter and I were building this connection with her again and and the kids and I'm like now where do we go from here and I tried as much as possible to reinforce you know, my daughter needed to come home to go to work. And I said, I'll drop her off and I'll come back. And, you know, you need me to stay for the week or however long I can work from home. I, you know, I can, I can be here to help you. And, you know, it was thank you, Dora, but 
kind of no thank you. Um, you know, no, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Um, and then it was out of the blue. Now, mind you, I remember Dawn. I met her one time because I was already moved out of the house. And um, one time I went back to visit, she was there. And that's when I met her. And then life went on. Sure. She, I believe she has a better recollection of, you know, the occurrences, but, um, you know, it was when she got a hold of me, it, I was just like, Oh my God, somebody else. And then I had another one of Gwen's friends message me and said, can I ask you a question? And, you know, I was like, absolutely. And she said, do you think he did it? I immediately called her this friend and started talking. So through that, I ha- I now have three friends of her, three different states whom I never met or I didn't know of two of them all saying the same thing to me. And mm-hmm. none of the three of them, yeah, the three of them did not know each other either. So it was very weird. Okay. So they weren't like kind of already in a group and kind of, egging each other on in any direction. Everyone came to that conclusion independently and then, you know, started kind of poking at it with the other people like, Hey, am I, am I, am I crazy here? Or do you guys think this too? And that's when it was kind of clicking for everybody. Exactly. Don was the first one to contact me. Then there was a friend of Gwen's, a former coworker in Cleveland, um, that messaged me and I was in contact with her And then ironically, I had asked Eric, I said, there was a friend in Gig Harbor that um, Gwen had mentioned it to me. Can I have her number? And he sent it to me and I called her and she, she knows um, a lot of things and helped Gwen in a lot of ways. I think more than what she shared with me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And she's, She's not a talker and I wish that, I mean, maybe, maybe she would be, I don't know, but, um, you know, it's just like these three people, one in Washington, one in Virginia, one in Ohio, none of them know each other and they're all saying the same thing. It's just bizarre. And then I had a friend of mine get in contact with, um, Gwen's sister-in-law in Texas, because remember, I hadn't been in touch with anybody. Through that, I ended up speaking with her. And then, it, you know, we have similar thoughts. And like I say, we each have our own story of things that occurred. It, it was just, um, I can't even explain all the things that, that had happened. It, from having a bonfire and burning mom's clothes to, you know, one day I'm having a girl come from another country and she's gonna, you know, sleep on the couch and we're, you know, maybe going to get together. And then the next week he's kissed a girl and now he's marrying her. And, um, he invited me and my husband to the wedding. Now, why would I do that? You know, I mean, I couldn't even, Yeah. and I don't know if you guys watched the video Yes. that was on YouTube and it's yep. like the little boys, like I'm here because, you know, kind of my dad wanted me to be here and it, it was just bizarre. Just the whole thing is bizarre. Now I met Miriam and really I had to, park at the end of the road, talk to myself like, Dora, you have to be nice. This is what it is. The children are here. Um, You know, I I went there under good intentions with the kids. She, She never, she was very kind to me, but I look at it like she was probably here for a green card. He probably wanted a wife. I don't, I really honestly don't think he was seeing her before that. Okay. Um, I, I feel that it was, um, he needed to have a woman in his life or something, somebody to help take care of the kids. Gwen was then a stay at home mom. She did everything. Mm-hmm. 
And I'm, I'm glad now, you said now. that because I speculated that that may have been something that was going on earlier, but I, we're not close to the case. Yeah. So if you're close to the family, I, I would tend to side with you and say, okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, especially yeah, when you're, I, when you're I, describing I, his personality. Yeah, I don't feel that at all. Um, that he, he had cheated on her or anything like that. I don't feel that. Um, I think that he had met her through however he met her an app or dating site. Um, I was just shocked that he would involve the children so quickly. Um, she told me, Miriam told me that, you know, they had kissed, they had come, um, he had brought her back to the house. The, the children were like, they were dressed nicely and you know, the house was clean. It was like, he was planning on whomever he met was bringing them back to the house to have them there forever. And then they, they went to wherever Miriam was staying and uh, with, with family or friends and, you know, they had dinner. I mean, and it was like, I don't understand. You know, I couldn't comprehend in how many days you knew this woman and then you were marrying her. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no courtship. So in my eyes, it was, I need a wife. And for her, my opinion was I need a green card or something to stay in this country. Um, I don't know what happened upon, you know, her father passing and they went back to Kenya and then when she was coming back, she got deported. I don't know any of that story. I do know as of a month ago, um, when I inquired with, uh, she told me that Miriam wasn't back. Okay. So I'm, a, I'm assuming she's still in Kenya. I do know that he is in gig Harbor, what he's doing. I don't know, but yeah, I, you know, there are just stories upon stories and I don't even know well, and, and where are, to begin. And that. Are you sure? Um, no, I'm not saying, are you sure? Like, like questioning you, but with, uh, they went back to Kenya because her father did pass away. Cause that is information that we didn't really have. We're like, Hey, was he going out of country? Like, cause that would be suspicious, but like she really had her father pass away. So that is what, um, he had posted something on Facebook at the time that, you know, his father-in-law, he did, didn't have a chance to meet him in person, but he had passed away and they were going back to Kenya. His parents, um, the children went with the grandparents while they were going back to Kenya for the funeral. And then Eric came back and the next day the children flew back home and Eric picked them up at the airport. Um, it was just bizarre. And he, that's when he started making all the allegations about, you know, the, USA and you know she was deported and why I don't know um, I just know that they were coming back to the country and he was allowed in and she was not sure um, he had cut me out of their life um, let's see probably um, more tickle me June or July he stopped communicating with me. Um, he cut me out of the, you know, their lives period. And the only way I knew anything about them was through, you know, another party that was in touch with them. And it, it was just very manipulative. And I think part of it was he was nervous because any time any of them needed me, I dropped everything and I drove the three hours up there to be there. And he knew that I could do that. And I think that that kind of um, maybe scared him. They, he was, they weren't alone now. Gwen had found me. I was close enough. I had the ability to just drop and go. Okay. Um, there, was a, there was even a time that his new wife called me and she said, Dora, I'm, she said, can you come up here? She said, Eric's in the hospital apparently 
I don't know what happened, but he had gotten really drunk. He was on somebody's property. I don't know all the details. Um, something with the property owner had told him to get off, and he showed the property owner a gun. And I believe that they reported it to the police and gave him the license plate. By that time, Eric was back home. The police came to the house to uh, question him. And the next thing I know, I guess he was so drunk, she could not wake him up. The police went and physically got him, and they took him to the hospital. Um, She called me at that point. She didn't want Eric to know that I was up there because he would be very, you know, very mad. And, um, the next day she, Miriam was able to talk Eric into letting the children go and visit, you know, other family in Texas. And so I took them to the airport the next morning and the children were at least able to get away for, you know, quite some time. Um, I think it was like a week maybe. And then he demanded when he got out of the hospital, like three days later, you know, they send you to wherever and you sober up and then you get to come home and no repercussions of how many times do we allow this to happen before it's an issue. Um, so he had no clue. I was up there at that time, at least to my knowledge. Uh, nobody told him and, um, yeah, I don't, I don't even know. There's just so, so many things that occurred and it's kind of scattered the, the well, story. And to, and to your point before too, you also have your own life, your own children, and you're trying to juggle this, which is more than anybody normally should be ever able to handle. So I can imagine like yeah. what a whirlwind it was. It, you know, that's why I felt that it was necessary for all the documentation. When, after I spoke to Dawn, she's like, Dora, you need to contact somebody. Something's not right. It's not right. And I, I did. I called, um, I called Washington State, and they're like, you need to speak to Trooper Knox. Um, he was the one that was originally on the scene, and I did talk to him, Um And at the end of our conversation, he said, you need to contact the detective. I'm like, detective? I'm like, what? And then he gave me the information, and I did that. We kind of played um, email or phone tag for a day or two. And then the detective and I talked, um, and I told him my story. And he said, you know, Dora, at the end of everything we've talked about, you never said if you felt he did it. And I said, you know, you're right, but why would I sit across from the table the day everything from my daughter and ask her, do you think he did it if I didn't feel that way? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the detective and Christian asked you that at, after all of your yes. conversations? Yes. Well, the, our very initial conversation we had, okay. that was his question to me. Okay. And... Yeah. And I said, well, why would I ask, you know, ask my daughter, do you think he did it? Now, just keep in mind, my daughter is working on her master's in mental health. So God forbid she's going to really use this on her mother. <laughs> yeah. But, but there are just so many instances I was able to take one time for a weekend. I went up and got her and then brought her back. And then I was able to keep her one time for a week. Now, would never come. He always wanted to be home, close to home. And I think he was the secret keeper and, you know, they looked after dad. And so I think that he was probably just afraid he lost his mom and, you know, he knows dad's an alcoholic and he knows dad's been drinking, but they never told me. Yeah. I only knew all of this because of other people telling me. Mm -hmm. And You know, when I brought Maeve home one time, we came back from the store and we were sitting in the car and I was talking to her and she just kind of like, I, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know what happened. And she's like, and my dog, she's like my noodle dog. I loved him so much. And I said, well, what happened to noodle? And 
she said, I don't know. Dad took him for a walk and dad said that, you know, he just dropped over. Um, you know, there's been many stories with the dog. The dog had COVID. The dog just had a heart attack. And this was like just days after Gwen had passed. And in fact, he, you know, you don't, ha- they never walked to the dog. The dog, they let out the back patio. He had the yard to run in and he would come back. Mm-hmm. So for him to take the dog on a walk was suspicious to begin with because yeah. they never walked to the dog. <laughs> yeah. I think you touched on a key point that was a, a big red flag for us when we initially looked into the case and haven't even talked to anybody yet, but it seemed as though almost every story, even the small stories that were, you think would be innocuous just seemed to never be consistent. Uh, like you said, no. like at, sure. Like no. at first it was, he had COVID and then Gwen had COVID. Then the dog had COVID. So that's why he had to get rid of the dog. And when we talked to Dawn, um, she was speculating just because, you know, they had other pets, but she, she kind of put together that he seemed to have been cleansing anything that was tied to Gwen. Cause that was Gwen's dog. In fact, Gwen was going to write a blog. She was a vegetarian and she was going to write a blog. What my dog ate today. Because if Gwen was cutting sweet potatoes, the dog came and got sweet potatoes. I mean, you know, Gwen would text me that she was at the bus stop with the children and the dog was with, I mean, the dog, it was her dog. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, I don't think that the children were supposed to say anything to me, but the kids were like, we had a bonfire. And I'm like, you did. I'm, I'm like, that must have been fun. You know, just always trying to make it positive. Mike, our next partner, has a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because, as many of you know, I got into extreme ironing and cheese rolling and was feeling slow and sluggish on training days. I was taking more supplements than I could count and nothing was helping. One of my fighters at my gym recommended Athletic Greens AG1 Daily Health Drink and I've never felt better. One scoop of AG1 in the morning has me ready to take on Jackie Chan by the time I get to the gym. One serving of AG1 contains 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens that support better sleep quality, recovery, mental clarity, and alertness. All things that are very important in the world of combat fighting and cheese rolling. Best of all, it costs less than $3 a day, from which my own experience is cheaper than getting all of the different supplements myself. For less than a cup of Starbucks, you can make an investment in your own health that I can personally vouch for. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com forward slash E-M-E-R-G-I-N-G to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, we, we burned mom's clothes so they could um, go up to heaven with her. And I'm like, what on earth? You know, Gwen, knowing Gwen, she would have wanted them donated to somebody yeah. of youth. Um, she would not want her things burned. She would want somebody else to have them to utilize them. Sure. And so it, it just, um, it seems like a traumatic thing to do in front of, you know, children. Kids that just lost their mom too. Burning yeah, well, her stuff. Like Don said there, he was burning like journals and things too, like other items. Yeah. She kept, um, she kept journals upon journals of, um, you know, things that they did or whatever. And I don't know if it was done through her therapy. I know that her and the children, she did take the children with her to therapy, um, uh, you know, to where they went, I, you know, that was never talked about. She just said, you know, they did go to therapy, 
when I mentioned to Eric about, you know, him and the children going to therapy to help through this traumatic, you know, situation. No, we don't need therapy. We, we, no, no. He was very banned against it to the point that when I mentioned to the children, I'm like, Hey, do you guys want to talk to anybody? And they're like, no, we don't need any help. We're fine. Everything was fine all the time. We're fine. We're fine. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was just, you know, and one thing I had forgot to mention as well, um, they told my daughter the day that everything happened, you know, something's wrong. She said, something's wrong. Mama would never, um, throw herself off a bridge. She loved Ski and I too much. Oh, and, it's so heartbreaking. Yeah, I I just, you know, my my daughter's like, Mom, I just I wish I had more time, but you know, when it got quiet and the house was not that large and it was on one floor, she said when it got quiet, I didn't want anything to be overheard of what she was sharing with me. And we, you know, it was always like on eggshells all the time. Yeah. And in fact, the, the whole time that I had the one weekend, he never called. He never checked on her. Um, you know, I would tell her, do you, you know, do you better call your dad. And, you know, just, I mean, being a parent, I, m- my child better call me, check in. But it was like nothing, no big deal. Was your daughter going through her, her master's at the time or going into the, the mental health types work? So she, um, she is in her master's currently. Okay. She's in the middle of it. Um, she was in that field. Um, so all the skills she probably knows now she didn't have then, although mm-hmm. she, she's, you know, very smart. And I mean, the, in fact, when she was younger, the children would say, um, she would come home, mom, the kids on the playground told me that I'm like Dr. Phil and Oprah. (laughs) And I mean, she was like nine, you know, eight, nine years old then. So she was destined to do this, but she needed to figure it out on her own. Sure. Um, well, and I, I asked because, um, it sounds mm-hmm. like she was intuitive to that. And if she's going into that field, she knows a bit about it. And sh- if she's, you know, with you also sensing it, I look at that as you have a gut feeling she's working to be a mm-hmm. professional at this and also senses something is different. Like she feels like she can't even discuss openly with the kids because it could potentially be a hazardous environment to do that in. Yeah. And, and at that time, her job, she worked for a nonprofit that, um, with children that she would assist their therapist and, and it would be more in the field where the therapist was more in the office. So she, you know, had a, a well-rounded sense of everything, you know, that was going on. But I think it, you know, she doesn't really talk about it. And she, she's like, mom, he's crazy. He's doing nothing but, you know, stress to you. Just cut it off. Go on your day. And I said, but I'm still attached. You know, I said, she didn't know Gwen, but for those short times. And they started a texting rapport, like, let's ask each other questions. And, you know, like, what's your favorite color? What did you do? And so they were catching up of 20 some years of time Mm -hmm. together. And the last one had seen my daughter, she was like 18, 20 months, you know? So, and here she is a grown adult. Yeah. But, um, you know, so they started that connection and to the point she can't even listen to the podcast. Um, I told her about it. I was like, Hey, this is, it was maybe a month later. She said, you know, on Reddit, I made a comment. And so I went back and I Googled it and, and read it. And I was just like heartbroken that she didn't even, she couldn't even bring herself to listen to that. And that she remembered that, that phone call. And cause at that point she was still at home and, um, you know, she's like, mom, what happened? What happened? I'm coming with you. I'm calling off work. And so, it, you know, it was, um, yeah, it, 
No, that is tough. That is tough. And I, I wanted to get your reaction because we kind of we kind of went past the whole the whole actual when you were notified mm. that they thought that mm. she had jumped off the bridge and committed suicide. What was your initial thoughts when you heard that story? So Eric's the one that said that they were looking for her in the Tacoma Narrows. Um, and through, you know, when I called him, when he told me not to come up there and we have to drive over that bridge to get to their house. And the whole time my daughter was driving and I'm looking and looking and I'm, I'm just like, I don't see helicopters. Where are they now? Again, it is the Northwest and there are plenty of cloudy days at, you know, seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning. And I'm just like, well, I don't understand. I, I couldn't process it. And then I, you know, at that point, it was nobody said she physically jumped off a bridge. It was when I talked to Trooper Knox that he told me um, the situation that, you know, was in the police report, um, you know, that there was the van that was wrecked. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm just so like, my mind is going a thousand different places and um he had told me when I talked to Trooper Knox he had said you know that was a weird night and I said you don't have to tell me that I understand it was a weird night Mm -hmm. what you know what happened and he told me that he had arrived on the scene there was the van that was wrecked um he said it, it was very odd it wasn't didn't seem consistent within there's guardrail on that bridge. Um, I believe if you watch the video footage I had taken from the, from their house to that bridge, um, he said it wasn't consistent with like an accident on the guardrail. He said there were wood pieces stuck in the side of the car. And he said there was a man that had his own mental challenges that said he had seen Gwen, he had talked to her and, um, you know, he looked back and there was a shadow going over the bridge. You know, it was just like, what, you know, I, I just don't understand that. But this guy said that there was somebody in the van and okay. I know he may, may have been, maybe he was homeless. Maybe he does have his own mental issues maybe he was drinking but when he the consistent thing he says is that somebody was in the vehicle aren't you going to look at that eric was a marathon runner mm-hmm. i mean mm-hmm. the detective even asked me how fast can eric run and i said you don't know i don't know but he did tell my daughter and the detective never called my daughter And I said, you know, she was there the day with me. She would remember more. She was in tuned more. She spoke to the children. I'm only hearing this through her of the things that the, you know, that had told her. They weren't said to me. I would think that he would want to call her. She's an adult at that point. She's over, you know, 20, you know, 18, 21. She's over that age. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just weird that he never called and spoke with her. And so anyway, it, it just was like, why the detective asked how fast he could run. And it was bizarre after that. Um, after that conversation I had with the detective, the next day, Eric posted something on Facebook, a picture of him running the marathon over that bridge with the time that he had ran that day. And I sent that, I did send that to the detective, um, that picture and that post um, of that time. And so I figured if it was like 12, they had it mapped, the detective mapped it out as I think it was like 12 point whatever miles to the house, to the bridge. And his time would have allotted that to be able to run back to the house after that time. Yeah. And one of the things that always irked me too is 
in the report, the detective said when they had called him to inform them that they had found the van. So they didn't know where Gwen was at the time. Um, Mm -hmm. His response in the phone call was that the van was parked at home and everybody was at home. But at that point, he would have also known that that wasn't the case. Yeah. And, you know, their house had an alarm. Like if you open the front door, it's like beep, beep, front door open, Mm -hmm. garage door open. And I mean, I, I've heard that. And then the back door, I don't know that the back door had that feature on it, but, um, I do know the garage door and the front door did. And if she had, when she was leaving that house, you didn't hear that. You, you didn't hear that. So yeah, we know for sure she went out the front door because we have the video of that. And it is very dark. And that's the only place that had lights at the house was at that front door. The, so in their driveway, why did the, why did they end the video there? Why couldn't we see her trying to walk down the steps? Why was that video ended there? Mm -hmm. Did Did the detective or the police see any further video? And I mean, we only seen that because he posted that on, on social media. Yeah. And from the report, it sounds like that's the same. That's the only video the detective had was that same social media post, which was then subsequently deleted. Uh, but we, we did get, um, I forget who sent it to us, Mike. Somebody sent us the actual, I video. think it was Dora. It was Dora. Okay. Yeah. I think oh, it was, was Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I sent because that's all that I had. And, and now he deleted his Facebook. So it kind of deleted that video, but through some digging, through another person, I was able to get that video. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just, um, there were so many unanswered questions and, you know, look, I know it was at, at the beginning of COVID and a lot of things were going on. I mean, I immediately threw myself into seeking a counselor and she, a week before actually all this happened. And when I called her, she said, Dora, you do know, you're going into a home that maybe there's COVID. And I said, I don't care. I am healthy. I don't care. You're telling me that my sister is missing. And, um, you know, you, I, I don't care. COVID, no COVID. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, I don't even know if COVID happened or not. I, you know, I can't say, I just don't know. For, for their test results and stuff like that. Yeah. I, According to Eric, I would ask him, you know, weeks after, did you get, did you get the results? Did you get the results? He would tell me, no, Uh, I'm sure the detective was able to get the results. But again, that was never shared with me personally. So I don't know. Yeah. That was one of our, our speculations also, because this was early COVID because I I remember it specifically because March 19th was my birthday and that's right Mm -hmm. when it was kind of like, we're starting to lock down. People are scared. People don't know what's going on. So we, yeah, you know, I, I try and look at more of the silver lining aspect. We looked at the the lack of the in-depth investigation is more of this COVID thing is happening and people don't know what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. So like, did the things get overlooked because, you know, there might be people that think like this might be the end, like this might be the plague. So no, we're not going to focus our energy on this type of thing. Um, but I also found it odd that they were reporting all the COVID positives that were coming out because Washington state was one of the first states that had early positive cases. And there Mm -hmm. was no mention in the news at this. Now that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I just remember at that point, like every day getting an update of like one by one, the people who got COVID and where they were. And all of a sudden we're seeing on social media, I've got COVID, she's got COVID, the dog's got COVID. And when you look at the news reports, there was like, I don't know if you remember, Mike, like a 60 year old man and like two other people were reported as actually having it there. And, you know, you know, he's saying, well, she was hospitalized, but they're going to send her home COVID positive. And I'm like, I don't know if they were doing that. They were like locking people down at that point. So it wouldn't spread. And so like the stories didn't match up ever. And then your daughter might actually be a good reference for this. But the other thing that rubbed us the wrong way was when someone commits suicide, and again, I am not an expert, but I have P, I, I have family that are therapists, and I've talked about this with them. And the actions that someone who's actually going to commit that, unless it's like the heat of the moment, are typically to disconnect, 
you know, give away personal belongings, things like that. And it sounded like things were starting to really go good with her. You know, she reconnected with you. Uh, when we talked mm-hmm. to Dawn, Dawn was saying, you know, she felt like she was doing really good. She like was in a good spot. And then the thing that always, always got to me was the children and how she would yeah. never do anything that would put the children at harm. And what Dawn had mentioned was with the domestic abuse type things, or um, there was one incident where Eric was out in front with a gun, waving it around saying he was going to kill himself. And she had to call the Gwen had to call the police and the children were there watching it. And she, I think um, it might correct me if I'm wrong. Cause we just did this the other day, but Dawn said something like she would not leave those children in that home by themselves. She called her friend in gig Harbor and said, can you come get the kid? And according to the friend that I spoke to, and I don't know if you guys reached out to her or not. um, So I don't want to throw her under the bus or anything. Yeah. I say, if you want to like message us after this and tell us her name, just don't say it on the air now in case they don't want to be identified. Exactly. Um, She told me Gwen had got a hold of her and said, can you come and get, the children and keep them as long as you need to. I, and, and I believe she did. So, um, this was shortly after I believe they moved into the house, but this friend also, her and her husband, um, helped Gwen a lot when Eric did stupid things like hit with his drinking and traveling and, and whatnot. So yes, I definitely will get you her, her contact information. Now, you know, when I had met Gwen, um, initially I had purchased this necklace for her and it had like, um, a little, it was in a shape of a tear heart and at the bottom of the heart or not a heart, it was like a tear drop. And at the bottom of it, it had a diamond. And I said, you know, these are for all, um, the tears that we cried in the past and now we can let it go and let build a future. We were talking about girls weekend and our family's taking a vacation to the coast together. And, you know, I, we had made like a lot of plans and we found out we had a lot of similar things now with adults in common and what we were going to do. And now we have some things we probably would have disagreed upon. She's anti-gun and I'm like, Hey, you know, I have, you know, my license to carry even though I don't I do have and you know we we disagree to we agree to disagree but yeah we still had a lot of things in common that we like to do especially in the Pacific Northwest and so we were making those plans and that's why when they they said it was suicide I I'm just like I I don't understand I don't understand that we had plans I'm not finished yet you know, she, she wasn't finished yet. She had things she wanted to do. She talked about the blog she wanted to write and how involved she was with the children with, you know, with ballet and with piano. And I mean, she would send me videos of playing the piano and he was really good. And I, I just don't understand it. She was not done living her life. She was not done. I do not believe it was suicide. Some may differ with me, but Mm -hmm. that is my opinion from my reconnection with her. Um, And I'm definitely one, as I'm looking through these emails, um, I must have jotted down notes at some point in time, but I definitely want to get them to you because a lot of them will give you a lot more, you know, feedback of the time when they happened because it would happen. And that night I would email. Okay. And that's kind of like, I guess my journal to the detective, you know? Um, but there, you know, there were many bizarre things that had taken place that I would email. Um, again, he cut me off at that point in time. And so that's like where I say there are three key people into knowing the before would be Dawn, her being such a good friend and trying to help out and knew of so many things, people to fill in like the friend, I'll send you the number. Um, there was a friend in Ohio that, you know, she's not too talkative once in a while. 
you know, I'll message her and, or she'll message me. Um, and it's very sporadic and out of the blue. Um, and then the sister-in-law in Texas. I have yet to come across one of them that doesn't share your sentiment, Dawn's sentiment. There, I mean, even people that uh, should theoretically be on Eric's side. I won't say who they are because I don't know if they want to share, but yeah, people who, when they fine. reached out would like, okay, we're going to get the other side. And they say, Hey, I was friends with him. Um, I am in this very close relationship with him. I kind of agree with what you guys have come, come to the conclusion. So Pete, like I said, it's people that are supposed to be ones that would be defending him are also wondering if that's he, he possibly caused these problems. And one of the things that still sticks with me, my hopes that, all of this, you know, raising this awareness will help reopen the case it was uh, Detective Christian's last comment on his last report that we have. And it's, I quote, though unusual, these documented circumstances do not readily identify any over malicious intent behind Gwen's passing. However, they do present cause for consideration. Those with opinions about the welfare, uh, the welfare of Gwen's sur- surviving children were encouraged to report their concerns to local CPS. So to me, that read in that, maybe at a legal level, he might not have had what he needed at the time, you know, to bring charges or hold him. But I don't think he believes this was a suicide fully either. I'm putting words in his mouth. This is my speculation right. about his comments. So this is me. This is not his words, but we've been trying to get a hold of him to say, Hey, come on here and say what you're allowed to say. Um, I don't know what they can say or what they can't say on a case that's been closed or if it's still open or whatever. But I know between you, other people that want to remain anonymous, we have more information that was not anywhere in any of the reports that I think would be viable information to potentially reopen the case. Yeah. You know, that's why I was digging for his last email communication because he CC'd um, Don, uh, Amy and I in it and none of us can find it. And I just find that bizarre that out of three people, we cannot find this email. And basically it had said, um, you know, after his conclusion, he did close the case and there was no concrete evidence was, I believe the terminology he used. Um, and that was the reasoning for closing the case. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I, I don't want to quote it without it being accurate. And I, I, for the life of me, none, not one of the three of us that it's just like it disappeared out of there. And I don't, I don't know what happened. Did we delete it in the heat of, you know, we're mad. I mean, I went back through my deleted messages and I, I just can't find it. I wish I could. Um, there, you know, there was a time when I did call, child protective services. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've probably, I've called them maybe on, um, I called the police maybe on three or I, I don't remember how many times, but I called them on several different occasions and I, you know, they went out there one time and well, it was the night that he had sent, um, he and I, and at this point, I don't think I were even talking to each other, um, text messages. And I think I did post them up on that page regarding, you know, how he had a gun and he held it, you know, in his mouth and, you know, whatnot. And I, I was texting him, you know, like, look, you have these children to take care of, you know, I even asked him, do you have, you know, what would happen to the children? And I mean, all of this stuff. And at the same time, unbeknownst to me, he was texting and doing the same stuff. And then when we compared notes, we're like, well, he probably was drunk and he did have a lot of guns. So the next morning when he wasn't answering my phone calls and he wasn't answering, I did. I called. And Mm -hmm. for a well check. And then he got mad because I called for a well check. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Go back and read your text messages. That's why I called. You didn't answer the phone. 
And he's like, well, we were making breakfast and getting ready for homeschool. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. You didn't answer your phone after those text messages. What yeah. am I to think? I just lost my, my sister. I don't, I don't want to have to go through this again. And so he got mad at me for that. And I called another time and I don't know whatever came of that. And then the one time I called and the police officer, whom I don't remember his name, said to me, why do you want me to go out there? I need cause. And I told him my reasons why. He said, look, I have personally been out to that property between, I don't remember if it was six or eight times. And every time I go out there, everything is fine. And I said, of course they're fine. Of course they're fine. They're not going to tell you anything different. And he said, you know, the last time I went out there, him, they were going out for a run. And he would not go out there. And the next time I got a phone call um, from some, somehow, I would have to go back and re- revisit. Um, but the, the grandparents, I've gotten in touch with the grandparents over the grandkids. And, the, you know, I said, look, anything you need, you need me to get there. I can be there. You just need to let me know. So they called me and they said, look, we had an instance with Eric yesterday. And if we need you to go to to be with the grandchildren, can we, can you go? Absolutely. In a heartbeat. I need three hours notice and I can be there. And they said, you know, okay, we have some cousin of the grandparents that lives in Seattle and she, you know, she's retired and she said, you know, she, if she needed to, she could, you know, get the kids, but if she couldn't get there, could you in a heartbeat? So the next morning comes and I'm on my way to work and the grandparents called me and she said, you know, we can't get a hold of the relative in Seattle. Could you please go the the, the the police department, they have um, the children, and I guess Eric was going to kill himself, and the little boy called the grandparents and said, you know, dad's really sick, he's throwing up, he won't go to the hospital, um, and the grandmother, they called the grandparents, and the grandmother told you know, I, I think it's time that you need to call 911. Eric overheard that. And he said, you're not calling 911. He put himself in the bedroom. He locked to the door and was outside just saying, you know, dad, we love you. Don't do this. We need you. And, oh my God. you know, the, the grandmother stayed on the phone with, um, you know, with, the grandfather called the police from Wisconsin. He's calling the police and they came. Apparently Eric had passed out. Um, and they told the children to run, you know, run to the top of the hill that they're there. And the children did that. Um, and they took him to the, you know, the police station. So in the meantime, now I don't, I don't even believe they went in, to the house, I, you know, I don't believe that they did. Um, they took the children, went back to the police station. I'm on now, the grandmother called me. I now flipped the U-turn and headed to Seattle, called my husband to let him know. Then the social service called me and said, you know, in order for you to take the children, we need you and your husband's license. We need, you know, some information. Sure. And, um, you know, we need to have somebody come and inspect your home. I said, whatever you need. Um, I, my husband sent, you know, he sent everything they needed. He said, Hey, look, let, let me know. I'll leave work so they can inspect. I mean, we have two empty bedrooms, you know, with beds and whatnot. We have room for the kids, you know, whatever you need. He said, I will be there. 
you go and take care of the children. I arrive at Gig Harbor at the police station and the police are like, didn't anybody call you? And I said, no. And he said, um, CPS took the children. They're now in Tacoma. I said, you are kidding me. That's another 40, 45 minutes back in my direction that I could have already been there. And I was furious. And I, they were very kind, but I let them know that the last time I did a well check, this is why I did a well check. And one of you told me you were not going, and this is why we're here today. And they gave me the address of the children's services. I drove back there. And um, then I was informed that I could not take the children they were going to Seattle and they needed to leave. And I said, why can't I take the children? And they said, well, you live in Oregon and not in Washington. And I said, you couldn't have told me this. The, on my way here, you wanted all of mine and my husband's information. You wanted to do a background check and go to my home. You knew we lived in Oregon. You had our driver's life. And they said, I'm sorry, the, the relative, the distant cousin, and the children met this cousin one time a few years ago for Thanksgiving. And that was it. They knew no other connection to this person. And I was livid. Um, I said, you have to at least let me see the children. Um, you know, they did let me see the children. I called the grandmother in Wisconsin and I'm like, what is going on? Why won't they let me take the kids? I mean, I was, I was livid at this whole situation could have been solved and they would not let me take them because I lived across, you know, out of state lines. And so I was like, okay, fine. I said, I'll, I'll get a hotel and I'll stay here. They said, how long are you willing to stay? And I said, how long do I need to stay? And they said, well, probably like a week. Okay, fine. I'll stay a week. And I even offered them. I said, you pick the hotel. You can have my car keys. Just let me keep the kids with me. And they said, no, no, the other lady had already been approved. We're, we're taking them to the cousin's house. And that's that. And the, um, you know, the little boy was just hugging me and, um, the social worker said, come on, we need to go. We need to go. It's going to, you know, take us like an hour to get there. We need to go. And she ripped him out of my arms, took them in a car. And I, I just, I, I can't even explain how I felt. Um, I just broke down and sat in their chair and probably cried for two minutes. And I got up, I called the grand and no, in fact, the grandparent was still on the phone. I never hung up on her and I was on my way to my car. And I said, you have no idea, no idea what your son has done. You have no idea what he is doing. None whatsoever. And she said, look, Um, I'm going to talk to the relative and see if she'll let you go up and, you know, see the kids and whatnot that did occur. Mm -hmm. I, so I drove to this family member's home and the children were there and they said, Dora, we didn't think you would come so quickly. And well, they probably, I would probably was like 30 minutes behind them at this point. And so she did let me spend a little time with them there and, you know, I took pictures with the kids and, you know, we were able to talk and play a game or whatever. And then, um, you know, the lady's like, well, we have to go to the store and we have to get them, you know, some clothes and some food. And I, I said, well, I can go and get that. And she was like, well, no, we can go and get it. So in other words, like your visit's over is what I felt like. And maybe I did overstay my welcome, but you know, it was just a long day. Yeah. And and I feel like you were probably the only person that had real genuine concern for the kids, which is in fear. It's infuriating for me sitting here, hearing it. Like I said, me and Mike have kids and I I can't imagine what's going through their heads. You know, what, what are they 12 and eight or nine? Yeah. You know, 
at the time it happened, I think it was like eight and 11. Um, you know, don't quote me on that, Mm -hmm. but it, it was, um, you know, I was the only person that physically was in their life that they were familiar with at that time. Yeah. Had they called Gwen's friend that lived nearby, she would have been there and got the children. Um, but the grandparents, they don't, you know, we never mentioned to them that obviously we suspect that your son did something or, you know, we need to keep this good for the children. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, I called the family in Texas the whole time and they're like, keep me posted, keep me posted. What? And, you know, again, they were livid as well. Here I am there. The children are familiar with me. I'm willing to drop everything, stay in a hotel with these children until their grandparents came. I was willing to do anything. And so were, you know, the family in Texas, they also were willing to do anything to help these children. But, you know, I, I get they have a job and I get the system is broken and it truly is broken because if that was the case, they would have let me stay there with the children. If not, you know, get in touch with Oregon. I mean, I live right across the border. You know, what do you need? I could have stayed wherever you wanted me to. I feel like they could have solved that in, of all the competent choices, they picked the least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not saying the lady wasn't nice, but her home was not a place for kids. It, you know, she is an older retired lady. I mean, very well with it. And and she was kind. Um, but her home was definitely, um, clean and everything had a place and, you know, yeah, not sure. a place that I would have wanted children to be bouncing off the walls and playing. And sure. Having like a good not time. that it wasn't safe, but like she didn't have kids. Sure. She wasn't prepared for kids. She wasn't expecting yeah. kids. The kids didn't even know her that well. Meanwhile, yeah. you have room for them. You have children. You've been with them through this entire ordeal. So you can relate to them. You can, they, they, they're familiar with you and yeah. they, they pick the, the latter of, or the, the former. Um, yeah. I mean, I, it was like, I was dismissed. You're done. You know, I felt, and this is how I feel with Eric and more so his family. Mm-hmm. Um, we have this chess game and you're the little pawn when we need you, we'll use you, <laughs> you know, when we don't need you, you're out. Um, they, in fact, when they had custody of the children that time, this was the first time um, they took them back to Wisconsin. They let me have a rapport with the kids. I mean, you know, I would make them cookies and I would ship that to them and I, we would text and we would FaceTime and, you know, always monitored. Of course, the grandparents were always in, in the background somewhere. And, you know, we had a good report. The grandparents invited my husband and I to come out there to visit the children. Mm -hmm. We booked, I mean, I immediately got off the phone. We booked tickets, hotel. We made sure it had a pool that the kids could swim in because we were told the children could stay the night with us at the hotel. And they just asked that they, you know, they could call the children. I'm like, absolutely. You can call them every day. You can FaceTime, whatever. And we had the car rental. We had planned we were going to arrive a couple days early. We had things we were going to do that were adult related. And then we were going to pick the children up. And we had made a whole week's worth of plans. It was like, and I'm a planner. So everything was lined out. And then about three weeks before that, the grandmother told me that they told Eric that we were coming and he was livid. And he did not want us to come. The children now were not allowed to stay the night with us. And we were only allowed to have them between, you know, a certain time. And, um, you know, they go to church on Sundays and now this and that. And so the whole game plan changed. And I, I was furious. 
I agreed. I made my efforts. The kids knew I was coming. I had that I had my tickets and everything. And then I was, I told them, I told the grandmother, well, it's probably since we can't see the children very much and do all the things we wanted to do with them, we are going to cancel our plans. And so unfortunately I had to tell the children that we were now not coming. And I told them, you know, that uh, kind of, I told them the truth that, you know, dad was upset that we didn't, you know, that we were coming and he didn't want that. And I don't want there to be issues with dad, the grandparents and the children. And, you know, but know that we were coming, know we love you. We will do whatever we need to do. You know, every time you needed me, I, I came when you lived in Washington. If you need me, I will come when you're in Wisconsin. You need to let me know. But I, at this point, I don't want there to be problems. Yeah. And so here I had to let these children down. Like they didn't have enough dis- disappointment in their life for the last year. You just now created more. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, we, we did not go that, that was the first time they were taken away. And then the second time I didn't know that they were, um, Sorry, my dog. I didn't know that we, you know, that they were even, anything had happened. There was like a Snapchat um, of like a chair. And then the next thing I know, there's a picture of a fireplace, which I knew that was a, at the cousin's house. I knew that, that fireplace. And I was like, something's wrong. You know, something is definitely wrong that um, they're not at home. And then finally, I think the grandmother told me that the kids were, um, you know, or no, not the kids. They were flying to Washington that they were going to get custody of the children. And I guess for legalities and until everything went through the court, they had to stay. So they rented an Airbnb and, you know, stayed with the children at the Airbnb and then Eric went back to Kenya again. I think that was the last time he was in Kenya. And he stayed for quite some time. And I don't know. I'm like, how are you affording this? How are you affording a mortgage, cars? I mean, I I don't know how you're affording this. But unless your parents are helping you, because they do have the means to do that. And so then... The other thing is, um, I, Eric said to me one time, he was like, Oh, I'm like, what did you do today? And, and I know I'm going back and forth a lot, but these things are like triggering in my mind. That's, that's perfectly fine. Um, he, you know, I said, what did you do today? He said, Oh, he's like, I've been going to the bank. He's like this girl, she had, you know, I've had to go to multiple banks and I'm like, do you, did you have to go take the death certificate to multiple banks because of multiple accounts or multiple accounts at multiple banks? And he said, there are multiple accounts at multiple banks. So I think that Gwen may have been putting money away somewhere that he didn't know about. Oh, I'm okay. guessing maybe I, I'm assuming I, I don't know that. Um, but all of a sudden he, uh, he gets the new Mercedes for the new wife. And why did he let my sister drive a crappy van that was on the verge of breaking down at any moment? And, but yet you now have the money for a Mercedes and he got a mini Cooper. And I'm like, they may not have been new, but still those things cost money yeah. on top of mortgage. And I mean, you know, I was like, are you, you know, after Gwen had passed and the, the cemetery, they had her body. Uh, he's like, Oh, you, you can't go. They're not allowing anybody to go when she's buried. And I'm like, okay. And I called um, the funeral home myself and they said, well, because of COVID, 
you can't come. I said, what if I just sit in my car? I don't even get out. I just sit in my car so that she's not alone. And they said, no, you, they will bury her and then they will call you. And I mean, I tried really hard to fight for allowing them for me to come to the cemetery bright and early in the morning and just to stay in my car, but they wouldn't allow that. And then she's buried and, um, I ask her, you know, are you getting a tombstone? Are you, and if you need help, we'll help you pay for it. We'll, you know, we'll buy it, whatever you need. Well, I guess he got one, but it didn't meet their requirements. Um, so somehow he eventually got another one that did meet the requirements, but, um, even the day it was near Easter time and I made the kids an Easter basket and my husband and I were going up there to take it and we were planning on, um, stopping at the cemetery first. And he told me, don't get there before me. He said the you know, the kids and I need to be at the cemetery before anybody. And I said, no, that's fine. I said, let me know when you're done and then we will go and we'll come to your house after. And then he texts me. Um, he's like, well, you can go to the cemetery. I don't feel like I'm up to going. I'm a mess today. So then we did go and he said, um, I said, okay, we're, you know, we're leaving the cemetery. We're on our way to your house. And he said, no, I don't think it's a good idea. You come today. Now, mind you, it's not a short drive. And I said, do you mind if we at least drop the Easter baskets off at the front porch for the kids to have them? And then he's like, oh, he's like, you can come. He's like, I thought about it. It probably was a bad idea to tell you no not to come. Yeah, it's very strange. And so we did. Yeah, we did get there. He had a suit on sunglasses and he was sitting on the couch and I went and you know with the kids and we were in the room playing and my husband was talking to him and the whole time he wore his sunglasses because obviously he was drunk and he had a beer in his hand and he like asked my husband do you want a beer and my husband was like no man I don't drink and drive and um, he was like oh okay he's talking about useless stuff. And, you know, my husband's like, you know, unreal. This is, he's unreal. There were beer cans lined up in their back property. Like he had taken the gun out because he had an obsession with them. He'd taken the gun out and was shooting them. And he had numerous, um, weapons. Um, oh my gosh. It, when his parents, the first time they were taken again, I'm backtracking. Oh, the first time that they were taken away and the grandfather flew in to the relative's house, um, and stayed with them. He, we had met him up in Washington and, you know, got to say goodbye to the kids before they were going to Wisconsin. And at that point, Eric was like, maybe I'm going to stay in Kenya, maybe this, maybe that, maybe I'm going to run out the house. And I'm like, he's going to run out the house? I said, he has all the children's pictures, the children's things. And he's like, yeah, we're gonna, they're going to put him in a shed. And I'm like, the shed out back is metal. We live in the Northwest. They're, everything is going to be ruined. So the grandfather let us take like all the pictures of the children off the wall. Um, he gave us some sentimental family things that were there, um, that, you know, I said, Hey, look, we'll keep them. We have the room. We can just store them. And he gave me the only thing that I know that he kept of Gwen was her wedding dress. And I don't know if it was in a closet and I don't know if he intentionally forgot to burn it or not, but the grandfather, um, he's like, oh, and here are these, you know, he had the new wife, wedding dress, and then Gwen. And Maeve's like, oh, 
this point, the children are calling their mother by the first name. She's like, that was, that was Gwen's wedding dress. And I'm like, that was your mom. And so I, I took it. I mean, to this day, I still have it in the closet. I don't know if anybody knows that it's missing or not, yeah. but I have it. Um, but you know, the behavior of the children calling the new mom right away, mom, and you've seen in the wedding video where she like drops to the floor when called her mom. And it like, that was very dramatic to me. And then now they're calling their mom, Gwen. And anytime they would refer to that, I'm like, even though your mom's not here, she's still your mom. So I will refer to her as your mom. Yeah. And it, it's just bizarre. I don't, I mean, in, in a matter of a week, you're now calling your mom Gwen. And then you're calling this lady. You don't even know mom. You don't think that was forced upon somewhere along the line. Yeah, I absolutely. I have a, a son and a daughter that are those ages right now. And they, they don't think that in depth about things. That's something that's being put into their head. Uh, absolutely. I know that. Um, yeah, there are so, you know, like I said, there, there are so many instances that I definitely need to get your, like some of this paperwork because I am way out of chronological order. And no, that is fine. That, that's, that's, I'm, I'm glad that you're able to get this stuff out. It doesn't have to be in perfect order because it is, you're going off of memory. Uh, we definitely would love to see the, the emails and stuff. And just like with any of our conversations, if there's things you don't want to in, have publicly included, you can just let us know. Um, I do have one okay. question. We've been going for a while, so I don't want to want to keep you all day. Um, yeah. In all of your interactions with Eric's family and Eric's side of the family, do they have any suspicion of, you know, that their son or their brother or anything is, is involved in this somehow, or are they just kind of disassociating from that potential? Um, you know, I don't think that they know. Then again, this is a family of, um, they raised him. So they're very, um, short and brief. And I, I honestly, after the second time the children were taken away, I've stepped back from them. Um, she did say, well, you could always go to Wisconsin on vacation. And I said, no, we tried that once before and that didn't work out. Yeah, that sounds very similar to stuff that Eric was doing. Like, okay, we're into this, and then last minute, like, get very controlling and, and consolidating that power over them almost. And and that's exactly how I feel that they are. They're, I feel that they like to control this situation. They only let you know uh, what they want you to know. Um it's very, so I've stepped away from my own mental health. I've mm -hmm. stepped away from being in touch with them. Um, I don't, I don't know what they feel, what they think. Um, other than the dad firsthand got to see, he, he told us that he was pulling alcohol bottles out of the wheel well of a car that they were in the bushes. He's like, we have, I have this bottle of wine. If you guys want it, we're like, no, thanks. And I mean, he, he went through the house while he was staying there with the kids when Eric was in Kenya, um, and cleaned out the house of, of everything. Yeah. But we all know, and, and I've told this to the grandparents, Eric needs professional help, not a week in the hospital, not a day treatment. He needs to physically go for months to rehab and get help. He's not going to any other way. He's not going to sober up. He's a good actor. No, I, no, I quit drinking. Nope, nope. And the next thing you know, we're in this rinse, wash, and repeat cycle. And he's, he's just an actor. And I think that he tells the parents whatever they want to hear. And the parents are a little naive in that aspect and believe him. But again, they are controlling. Um, you know, 
they have been nice to me. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it at that for them, for these children, but they raised him. And if, you know, they raised him and he acts like this, what are they like? Yeah. Well, I, I will say, um, when we first heard about this case from uh, an acquaintance I have that's connected to somebody who's close to Gwen, um, uh-huh. I didn't expect to get as emotionally invested in it as I have. Um, and what I can say, I, I'd say on behalf of Mike and I, is I, I'm very grateful that you were there uh, for those children. I, I would say, from what it sounds like, you showed them genuine concern and love and if there's any silver lining to that, they, they still do have somebody that has their well being as at the forefront. And that's you, um, and, and Dawn and the people who are close to Gwen that, that truly do care. And I would say are the most normal thing that they have going in their life right now. Yeah. I, you know, I will say that these felt so first of all, I, I kind of, when the podcast first was made, known to me I was like what you know what's going on who else knows about this and then I listened to and I'm like whoa there's a lot of gaps in here that have happened and they don't know about Mm -hmm. and a lot of people that have partaken in this and they don't know about so I found it kind of interesting that there are only bits and pieces uh, the gist of things but then um you know Gwen didn't have contact with any, any family for like two years before she contacted me. And after that point, and after she passed her family in Texas were like, they were all invested and I was invested. And you know, it's just none of that matters. They just cut, cut everybody out, everybody out. Like I said, I'm the only one. And I don't understand. None of us understand why um, Eric said not for them to have contact with the family in Texas because the, the day before they're like, I love you. Everything was good. Everything was great. And then it's like the next day cuts them off. It's just so bizarre. And I think it's because he knows that at any moment Gwen's family will be there. And I think that kind of scares him. I, I would agree. That's uh, again, this is, this is speculation, but I feel like there's, there's even for someone who may be a sociopath, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a clinician. Mm-hmm. I can't, yeah. I can't diagnose him, but his actions do like, there's gotta be potentially a level of guilt. And that's kind of what I read. And even with the actions mm-hmm. of his family, you know, it's their son. So there's probably blinders up, but I feel like the people who are, controlling and quote unquote, taking his side on this issue. There's something there. I feel like that they, in the back of their head and their gut is like, this isn't right. And that's why it's so weird. And it feels weird because it's like the elephant in the room that they don't want to point Mm -hmm. out. And the only way that they can not feel that is to cut off all the people that are associated with the victim of this potential crime. Yeah. And you know, I did what, any um, family member that cares about another family member would have done. And that's whatever you can. And I feel that's exactly what I did. That's exactly what the family in Texas did. And I mean, they're far away. So it's not as easy for them to hop in a car like it is for me. And I feel, you know, Dawn did everything she could being a, a, friend she reached out to me and was like hey something's wrong and I'm like you feel that too yeah it's just um well, and it's not and you guys are close to her and we're having people that feel that that are acquaintances of the couple that are like I know him and something should be done because this isn't justice and it's people who are not close to the family they're, like I said, just acquaintances. I don't want to say too much to give anything away because some of them just say, sure. I'm not a part of this, but it's people who you would not expect to want to get involved. And you know, mm-hmm. they're not in it because, oh, the podcast is starting to spread. They want fame. They're literally saying, I do not want my information shared. I just want this to get resolved if it was a crime. And, you know, some even said like, I haven't met 
Gwen personally. I mm-hmm. am acquaintance of Eric and there's something wrong with him. And when this happened, we all knew that's, and that's what everyone says. As soon as something happened and they found out, they said their initial instinct in their gut was the same thing you felt, the same thing Don felt. I think it's the same thing mm-hmm. the detective felt. It's the same thing we felt just hearing the story and which is why we're like, hey, if we can do anything, let's use our platform to bring light to this in case there is foul mm-hmm. play. So yeah, I, I, I can't say it enough. I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone that is reaching out and we're, yeah, on, we're, we're, we're bringing forward more information than we did have. Like you said, it was very spotty in the beginning because we're going off social mm-hmm. media posts and third hand comments of people who are acquaintances. And because of that, we're now getting uh, very good information and new information that I think the detective may not even had uh, based on the reports that could shed more light on this case. Yeah. And I truly am grateful for you guys to, you know, and to whoever brought this to, you know, their friend's attention to bring it to your attention. I'm truly grateful for that. And, um, you know, I, I, can't say the appreciation of putting this out there and it has brought so many people that felt the same thing, um, together. And there is a, um, somebody in their neighborhood that had been in touch with me and she's like, just to let you know, none of us believe it was suicide. And I'm like, these are people in their neighborhood and they just moved in this neighborhood like October. And this happened, you know, in March. It's, yeah. it's just bizarre. Mm-hmm. bizarre yeah, it's crazy. But I, I appreciate you guys and the time and effort that you're putting in to this and uh, you know anything that I can do to help or I'm sure there will be other things that will pop into my head because this has been two and a half years of you know nightmare for everyone absolutely um, yeah, just send it. You can always send us whatever you want. And again, you can always, if you want to get something off your chest that you don't want on the record, just say that. And we have a lot of people that I think, will it makes them feel better if they can just tell somebody, even if it's not publicly. And all we're going to do is keep, keep shining a light on this thing so it doesn't dim out. And in doing so, every time we do this, more comes out. People feel more comfortable with sharing. So even you coming out and sharing your story might... Um, build up the courage in others that are staying silent now to come forward. And all this hopefully will lead to an investigation, you know, reopening the case potentially. And at the end of the day, I think deep down as much as we want justice, I think if whatever, if, if good things can happen for the kids, that's, that's at this point, all I really care about is that they just can move past this and live somewhat of a normal life. Mm -hmm. And, and that's truly all I ask for. If they never have contact with me again, as long as they're healthy, they're happy and they have a good life. I'm, I'm happy for that because that's what their mother would want it. That's what she would have wanted for them. But, um, yeah, I definitely, I will send you guys an email with some information of a couple people and then, um, maybe we can be in touch where I can just make copies and send this media mail to you. That way it's a good reference guide yeah. to behind the scenes. stuff. So. Yeah. Well, well, Dora, it was wonderful meeting you um, digitally on the phone. Thank you very yeah. much for your time. We're like at like an hour, almost two hours. So I really appreciate it. I know you've been dealing with this, like you said, for over two years. So to take another two hours and repeat all this stuff, I'm sure you've repeated a million times in your own head and other people. And hopefully we can, we can take this and do some good. Well, I appreciate that. And again, if anything you need, let me know. I can help with whatever. Excellent. All right. Sounds well, good. Well, thank you very much. And you, you have a wonderful uh, 4th of July weekend. Thank you. You too. Bye. Uh, So that was the entire interview with Dora. Uh, It was long. We were talking about in the middle of this thing. This is the longest episode we've ever done. Yeah. And I I apologize for my audio quality. I had to call in that day because I had a, a a crabby baby at home. (laughs) So I crabby baby at home. I cannot join uh, Joe in person, but yeah, I think we learned a lot of very, 
In ton of new information. information. Uh, if you're watching the video stream, you saw Andy was pouring through a thick stack of paper. That is all uh, you heard Dawn kind of in the last half of the interview mention the documents that she's going to send us. We did get all of those. We're going to be scanning them in and going through those. It's a ton of hold. Hold it up real quick. I mean, look at this thing. This is about an inch and a half of paper here. There's uh, it's a lot. lot of information. Yeah, and we got to go through it and make sure you know what's in it is you know legal for us to to mention in public there's you know minors involved where we're going to redact that information and other personally identifiable information but eventually we are going to post that entire stack along with a lot of other stuff we have electronically. there's there's some pretty damning things in there yeah there are there's some statements there's a little in there. teaser yeah there's some statements in there there's that really make you think and we're going to post all of the stuff to our website that will be available for anyone to download and if you're listening and have a podcast that does true cr- true crime once it's on our website, you are free to use whatever information you can to get this story out there. That is what we've been telling people. Luminal, uh, the podcast that uh, we've been working with, they just did an episode on Gwen. And we let them use anything from our episodes. And uh, one of the, the hosts of that show listens to our podcast. And they've got a great show. I've listened to several of their episodes. And uh, there's a couple other podcasts that are, are interested in taking this story and that's our goal our goal yep, is to, to this get, spread we want to get this the pressure built enough to force the local law enforcement to reopen this case and give it another look well and i think part of it is not even necessarily because uh we we have so much new information i don't know really how to say that but yeah. we have so much stuff that we know they didn't have that when people talked to us they said we were never questioned but we have this we think it's useful they sent it to us uh, and they want to remain anonymous until they some subpoenas go out or something happens yeah. that will get the information out. So, And I was telling these guys while this interview was going on, uh, I've been contacted by several people in the local Giga Harbor area that want to remain anonymous, but they, they have other information. And they're like, well, you know, when this happened, I was thinking about talking to the police, and then I didn't want to. And... Um, so they they were on the fence about going to the authorities over this, and you know the case is closed right now. So there's really no harm, I think. And in, in if if anyone listening has information on this case, call the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. Yep. At a minimum, it, it lets them know that there's people still concerned about this case, and they don't think that the outcome of suicide is correct. And if enough pressure builds. They have to relook at it. They yeah. just have to. Now, Andy, you had never heard this interview before. You're a lawyer. Yes. What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? Uh, what is your lawyerly, which is a, not a word? Lawyer. Is, we know you're definitely not a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I am not a lawyer. What is your lawyerly opinion on what you just heard? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, it's pretty groundbreaking. Um, Here we go. <laughs> your listeners know this. They went through and, and heard this whole interview, and, and there's new facts that are being built, and there's big facts that came from this interview. And the, the biggest one that clear, clearly jumps out to me is the uh, mention of the knife, the bloody knife. Um, and we had kind of hit on this before. Uh, Gwen had like a laceration on her hand um, as she was leaving the video on Facebook. Um, it's noted that she had a, a laceration on her left arm. And we didn't really know where this came from. Still don't know where it came from, but a comment from, uh, I believe it was from the daughter, that there was a bloody knife in the kitchen that uh, that dad cleaned up is uh, just incredible to hear, uh, you know, yeah. from the horse's mouth here, basically. Yeah, and the fact is, we were talking about this while the interview was going, um, the fact that law enforcement didn't dig deeper on the fact that there was a bloody knife found in the house. And well, like, I don't think they knew that. At well, the, no. At the time, well, he meant, yeah, he did mention it, right? Or I, he, uh, that's what it was. She said, she, I'm trying to remember, that was like an hour ago. Yeah. Um, she made comment about how he said, so, oh, it's, it appears it was clean. It's been cleaned. Yeah. <laughs> and that, when I heard that, I was like, mm, that seems kind of suspicious. You have this guy who, in, to his own admission when he was calling in, kept changing his story, was not acting right, has a history of this stuff. They've been to that house multiple times. Yes. So this this they have this family is a record. This isn't the first time that they've no. been out there for erratic behavior, potentially violent behavior. You have this little girl saying there's been a bloody knife, this person who's missing. Because at that point they didn't know where she was. No. 
They so, didn't know she jumped. They just yeah. knew her van was so out you, on the So you have all of these things going on, and it just seems like it was overlooked. This is, again, I, I beat it to death. I feel like COVID fog was like, to them, probably wasn't a big deal at the time. And you know, we That's were, the only explanation I can think of. We were talking during the interview that we're, we're going to try and get uh, not a gig harbor or Pierce County Sheriff detective, but we're gonna we're gonna reach out to local law enforcement in the Milwaukee area to see if we can get a criminal investigator who is currently working for a police department to come on the show and kind of review the you know the cliff notes of this case and kind of tell us their opinion of how they would have maybe conducted the investigation and what you know you know off you know not uh, it's not going to be like their professional opinion but like their personal opinion like what do you think obviously like a law enforcement officer who's not involved in the case is not going to say like oh he's a murderer but yeah he can tell us if like oh this is pretty if they suspicious. conducted themselves appropriately yes it would be nice too to t- take them through chronologically also yeah. to get his opinion on without the information they would have known so say yeah. hey at this point authorities knew this yeah what would you do at this point they knew this what would you do and kind of just and see if it falls in line because I'll be hundred percent honest. If they if they say all the things that this detective did, like all right, I guess that's how it works. Yeah. Now we have all this new information. What does what does that do to you? Does that make you want to look at it again? Is that irrelevant? And I think this is important because we want to to bring a professional in who does this, you know, in a different part of the country has no connection to the family to the case or anything to hear their thoughts on how this investigation was conducted. I think really could give us a lot of meaning in, you know, was this a hurried investigation because of COVID? Um, Did they cut corners? Like we're not criminal investigators. We we're uh, speculating on things, uh, but we're just famous podcasters. (laughs) Semi famous. Um, But to hear it to, I'm really hoping someone will talk to us because I think it's really important to get a professional's opinion on this case. And I think the family would really appreciate this. It's almost like if you go to your doctor and they say you have cancer and you're like, well, I need a second opinion. Yeah. And they all say, no, you always do that in in the medical world. Like you get a second, third opinion, Yeah, like something, a case like this where it's very sketchy. It's not like a clear cut. Like we don't have video of her jumping from the bridge. Um, why wouldn't you want second, third, fourth opinion on the investigation? I, yeah, absolutely. you you can tell that they're grateful for what they did, but you can tell it with every single person they feel like there's something that was missed. And we really want to hear the side of the story from local law enforcement. We've reached out to them. We want them to come on the show. We want to talk to them. It could be... If this keeps snowballing, they definitely will probably have to. <laughs> I mean, we just want to hear their side of the story because there's a lot of gaps after hearing Dawn and Dora's stories, there's so many gaps that were not covered. I keep going back to the toll booth. And we've been informed from listeners now that they do have, it's just like Chicago, they have speed, like a speed pass. Yeah. But it would still, it would still record a picture of who was driving the car sure. at the time. And if Dawn was that incapacitated, there's no way she would have been driving. Well, and you heard uh, what she said about the vehicle, that it, the the police on scene said it didn't seem like it was crashed on the bridge. There was yeah, like right. wood, wood stuck in the side and things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, having that video or that picture of who was driving the car would have been so valuable in this case. I want to know from Pierce County Sheriff, why didn't you go and it be a very simple request? I mean, they probably do it all the time for criminal cases. Why didn't you just go and request the video from the bridge that night? Yeah. I mean, what... I want to know. And they said it. The guy said, I saw another person in the van. Yes. I want to know why they didn't. I just want to ask the detective, why didn't you go get that picture in that video? Then ask him right now. Uh, We've tried. (laughs) No, no, right now. Just ask in the microphone. Mr. Detective. (laughs) Detective Christensen. Detective Christensen, please come on Locations Unknown and tell us why that video and picture weren't requested in this investigation. If, If there's a valid reason for why they didn't have that video that might put this case to bed. Right. I mean, or at least put in perspective, like what was happening at the time. 
That's like, really, I think, well, really what we want to know is what was going on. And I think with the investigation, we we don't know what we don't know right here. Yeah. Uh, we have the police uh, report. Uh, that's the only information we have. And now we're hearing more and more information. Joe, you said this case is snowballing, right? Uh, and it really is. We're filling in the gaps, and it brings up more questions. And you know what was done, what should have been done, and what wasn't done, and, and what still needs to be done, really. So I think uh, you know having someone who could answer some of those questions, an expert. Uh, uh, would move this along quite a bit. Even a you know a, a spokesperson for the sheriff's department, anybody that would want to talk to us, because we have a stack of papers right here that has even more damning information in it that we we're not going to release just yet because we want to you know we got to go through it, cross our t's and dot our i's. But um, you know this stuff it, it's starting to really the few stack things up. that you found Annie when you're going through it was pretty remarkable. We can't let's not talk about it now. But right. uh, it's some stuff. You you called out some things. I was like, holy crap. Did he say that? There's a wealth of information here, right? Uh, this certainly will not be the last episode on the Gwen Hasselquist story. Absolutely no. not. And no. I think the overall impression I got from this interview was uh, Dora really kind of filled in the, the home life of what Gwen was kind of going through yeah. in the last few weeks of her life. And... That was the of, part Dawn missed out. Dawn only yeah. started learning about the negatives kind of at the last minute, yeah. whereas she spent time with Dora working through these problems, which to me, again, also shows she was sharing with her the negative, intimate parts of her life. Yeah. That's hard to do. Yeah. That's really hard to do with anybody. And she was willing to do that. So then what would cause her to up and do what she did? If Let's say she committed suicide and she stops that communication days right. before that, she had no problem sharing all the negative intimate details with her. She was reconnecting with her. She's talking about all those, again, talking about the wonderful things she wanted to do. Yeah. And then she goes and pulls this without notifying anybody. And then I think... Going against what she said she would even, like, want to leave her kids behind. All of that. The and statements from for- uh, Dora's daughter, I think, are very powerful. Uh, Dora's daughter was, you know, I think 17, 18, 19 at the time. Uh, going into college for psychology and she several times made the point to say like she did not feel comfortable in the home after Gwen's death she felt it was you know she just had a bad feeling about the environment and did law enforcement uh they question didn't question her? They, they didn't, didn't question, question her, her. Nope. um i just but, and and again i'm gonna defend them a little bit I know. why why would they it was right? suicide. It, and, and this was, yeah, the case was done. Yeah. This is all kind of after the fact, but that's, again, why, if we can get them to look at this again, we have a lot of good new information from so, all the people in Eric's life, Gwen's life, the neighborhood. It's, that's where we're getting all of this stuff. They're all, like like you said, snowballing, and we're getting people all the time. Come, and a lot of them don't want to share unless there's some sort of subpoena. I think I think we need to do a call to action to people who, now, just hear me out. To people who live in the area, people who knew Gwen, know of this situation, call the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. Respectfully. Respectfully. Peacefully and respectfully. We're we're not calling. We're we're not inciting anything. We're not inciting anything. Nowadays, you have to be careful. But, you know, like, if you have additional information, if you have, uh, you had an interaction with him or Gwen or the kids or anybody, if you lived near them and noticed something weird... Call the Pierce County Sheriff's Department and tell them, like, I, I had an issue with what happened. Call your local alderman. Call your mayor. Like, this this is not okay that this has been closed. Yeah. And even beyond that, Mike, I mean, we, uh, we're we talking about uh, <clears throat> the wealth of information that's out there. And yeah. initially on the episodes, we were discussing, like, ring video cameras or security cameras along the way. There could be private data out there that could... Absolutely. You know, even though the, the cameras from the bridge uh, were purged, there could be something out there. Yeah, I'd want to see more have... of that ring the camera. The thing with the yeah. ring camera is that data doesn't get deleted, from my knowledge, because there's been an uproar with... Uh, uh, I think Ring is owned by Amazon now. Oh, then they definitely have that data. And there's been there's been actual issues with uh, police departments requesting data from Ring without the occupant's permission, and like without a subpoena or a without warrant? a warrant. Which oh yeah, they that's, need a, a, that's they, a no bueno. They need a warrant to get that kind of. So I feel like some of the text messages that we saw in there yeah. could 
give enough probable cause to maybe get a judge to issue a warrant to subpoena Ray So Canva. what I'm thinking is, is there other... Did I say the correct legal terms? Uh, or I, close I don't enough? think so, but I won't correct <laughs> <laughs> Like I said before, all my knowledge is from like what law and order. What we're saying is uh, there needs to probably be a court order to get that footage from a person. Don't you only need probable cause to get a warrant? Yeah, I mean, it, there's no active investigation right now, right? So the case Oh, is so it'd be like, um, why are you here? We don't have subpoena <laughs> power. Presumably someone could subpoena this information as well but w what we really need is to like move the needle on the official investigation yeah and more information will do that and as we go through this process we're getting more and more i think uh dora did a good job of saying like when i listened to your first episode or your first two episodes you kind of knew what was going on but you were missing so many like things. the fifty thousand foot view right. of yep. what was going on and we see what we're missing now and we're seeing more and more uh by the week right uh so it's coming out. The thing I'm thinking of, too, is like if I was the investigator, I would have gone to Ring, who I, I think is owned by Amazon. I'm not sure. And I said, can't, you know, or I would have gone to I'm like, Jamie this while can, you're talking. Can I get a, a court order to see the Ring footage from that doorbell for the last for the 24 hours before Gwen died and like the 24 hours after she died? And then I would have gone and I would have asked all the neighbors in that neighborhood. Do you have any security cameras that face out towards the road? Do you have any, does anyone else have ring video? Could we potentially get video of maybe Gwen driving in her car down the road? Well, here we go. Ring was acquired by Amazon I for about a billion in 2018. The video doorbell maker has since expanded its law enforcement partnerships to more than 2,200 police departments across the U.S., allowing police to request video doorbell camera footage from homeowners. There we go. So if I was the investigator on this case, I would be going through the neighborhood and asking neighbors, you know, do you have a ring doorbell? Can't, you know, maybe at first you ask, can we take a look at your footage? And if not, maybe get a court order. Because what if we can get video of the van driving well, down the street? they were under the impression she drove to the bridge and jumped. So they probably didn't even think to do that. But, I mean, does it make sense if you look at the toxicology report and if she's loaded up with antidepressants that she could have, after watching that, like, 20-minute video of, the drive to the bridge that she could have done that. I don't know. I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. I know, but I'm just, you know where I stand on this, but I'm just saying like I know. in the heat of the moment with, cause we know more than they know. It's, to, you know, hindsight's 20, it just bugs me. Like if I was an <laughs> it's investigator, bugging, it's bugging literally everybody it's bugging me. It'd be like, man, this does not feel like a suicide. I'd want to keep digging. Yeah. Like if I was the, not if it's, the beginning of COVID and, it think, I don't, and you think, I and you care. think you, th yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're the first person to be hiding in your house. <laughs> no, there's got to be other it, anyone listening. If you're a criminal investigator, message us because this just bugs me. We're gonna it, get fake criminal investigators. Yeah, we probably give us their opinions. <laughs> but I think it, Mike, that Cletus uh, is gonna message doesn't us. Doesn't that bug you, Andy? <laughs> well, yeah, it, it does. But I, I, I also get what Joe's saying, right? I do. The what the information we have sitting here today is well <laughs> beyond what they had, and we have the benefit of hindsight. And there's yes. always a story when you look back; things make sense. Uh, that information wasn't available to the investigators, but that's why it's so important what, what you guys are doing here, what your listeners are doing, because... What we... What we what all we are doing. Okay, you're, you're, right. here, you're here, Andy. For good and bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe, or maybe he's doing some lawyer thing and be like, I'm not with those guys. <laughs> uh, right, right. Uh, uh, you figured me out. Um, <laughs> no, and I think more information will be coming, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, your call to action is, if anyone listening has anything of value, reach out please yeah. do we're not we're not saying harass your local absolutely law do not do that but no. if you have information that was not a part of the initial investigation we know the case is close they probably will not take the information down but if people are calling and they know people are still concerned about this case it just helps build the pressure to eventually reopen it that's mm -hmm. all we're saying yep it, if you have no and involvement, you uh, catch more flies with honey so yeah. if you're calling them and berating them yeah, it's probably they're going to go. We're, we're not why gonna, would they we're not going to post the numbers to the yeah. local law enforcement or politicians. If you it, it, if you're just trying to harass people, don't do it. And but if, if you're if you're not getting anywhere, send it to us too. Yeah, because we will continue to follow this. And as we get more, but new and better information, any kind of information, even if you just had like a chance encounter with anyone involved in this case that seemed odd, you should tell law enforcement about it. Yeah, I mean. Uh, that's the best thing you can do right now. We're going to keep trying to promote the case. We've got other fellow podcasters that are 
are picking up the baton and running with this story. And we're like we said from the beginning, we just hope the pressure builds enough that all we're asking for is the case to be reopened. Obviously, yep. everyone involved is innocent until proven guilty. We just think the case was closed too soon. Yep. Questions That's, need answering. Yep. Questions need More answering. information has come out since they closed if, it that is, if they I think reopen is very the relevant. case, yeah, if they reopen the case and, you know, take all of this additional information in and then eventually rule it still a suicide, case closed. That's all we want. Maybe. <laughs> For me, that's all I want. <laughs> I know. I just want him to reopen it. That's all I want. All right. So make me happy, law enforcement. <laughs> reopen the case. <laughs> that's why they're here to make Mike happy. We know well, you're listening. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to end this. We're at two hours and 10 minutes. Join this us on longest. Patreon next for oh, a, yeah. a fun episode. Yeah. We're going to finish up some more whiskey and we're going to do a fun episode on Patreon after yes. this. So thanks again for tuning into our show and all of you for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, subscribe on YouTube where you can have access to the extra content. Subscribe on Patreon to get access to that extra content as well. Uh, you can get some swag. If you do want to sh- support the show monetarily, you can get that swag through our Facebook store and our website. And last but not least, always remember... When enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you all next time.